Jihad has come to America. Constitutes the most devastating series of terrorist attacks in history. The only deen Allah accepts is Al Islam. And whoever seeks any other deen apart from Islam will never be accepted. Allah Akbar! And we stand together to win the war against terrorism. Terrorists struck in the heart of Russia with a suicide bomber blowing himself up Monday in Moscow's busiest airport, killing at least 35 people and wounding 180 others. Moscow's president called the event a terrorist attack and immediately called for increased security at Moscow's other airports and transport facilities. No one immediately took responsibility for the explosion, but Islamic militants in the southern Russian region of Chechnya have claimed responsibility for previous terror attacks in Moscow, including a subway bombing in March 2010 that killed 40. We read and hear from Muslim imams and leaders that Islam is fair and peaceful um, and that such acts of terrorism are isolated incidents which cannot and should not reflect the true intentions of Islam. Why then do we see a divide in the Muslim community on Islam meaning peace versus submission? Isn't it the Quran and the Hadith that unifies 1.57 billion Muslims globally? Or is that viewpoint too simplistic to make such a conclusion? Our dialogue tonight focuses on whether or not Islam is a religion of peace. Thank you for joining us on this Tuesday evening live here on Jihad Exposed. I am your host, Summer Goriel. I'd like to welcome our panelists of the night tonight. Uh, we have Pastor Hisham Chahab, a former Muslim and current expert on Islam and Christianity. Uh, we have Kamal Salim, ex-terrorist and author of Blood of Lambs. Um, also with us we have Anjum Chowdhury, a Muslim scholar and lecturer at the London School of Sharia, and we finally also have Mizanur Rahman, a British Islamic activist and lecturer in Islamic teaching. Uh, so in order for us to begin analyzing if Islam is in fact a religion of peace, we'll touch base on three aspects tonight. One, the objectives of Islam, two, the concept of jihad, and three, the history of, is, uh, of Islam. We of course have to look at the history, uh, contextualize it, and then project the potential future uh, the potential future based on the tenets of Islam. Uh, before we ask uh, Enjem to explain what Islam's objectives are, uh, Pastor Hisham, the main theory of Islam can actually sound quite appealing. I mean, it, it's calls to believe in one God, it calls to the submission to the will of God, and it also calls to prayer, fasting, and charity. Um, but we also see that Islam's history, as well as recent events uh, such as 9-11, Moscow and London bombings and so forth, have led people to question, is Islam a religion of peace? Does Islam allow people to live together in harmony regardless of their race, class or beliefs? Uh, most Muslims would say they are for living together in harmony, but is this because of Islam or is this in spite of Islam? What are your thoughts on that? First, greetings to you all, brothers and sisters. Uh, first, I want really to say that Kamal and I, we were in the training camps uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood and the Palestinian militias more than 30 years ago in the 70s. Uh, now we meet as followers of Christ. And uh, this is a testimony to, the, to Jesus Christ and the power of the gospel. And uh, let me begin a little bit with some uh, objective, if I can say, analysis of the situation. Islam or Islamic ideology as we see it today is the outcome of doctrine and political events. It's uh, kind of a uh, coincidence that maybe uh, the explosion in Russia took place. I mean, this program was scheduled before that terrorist act, but I'm saying that Islam, uh, who speaks for Islam really? Let me say that, uh, begin with, who speaks for Islam? Uh, uh, President uh, Barack Obama 
picked a consultant, uh, Dalia Mujahid, uh, an Egyptian American, and she, uh, with the professor at Georgetown, John Esposito, she went around the whole Arab and Muslim world and picked some statistics and came back saying, well, Islam is a religion of peace because most of those Muslims are peaceful. I agree that most Muslims are peaceful, but uh, who speaks for Islam? It's not Dalia Mujahid or Professor John Esposito. It's Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, who speaks for Islam. Muhammad is a model, and he was a model, model too, and still is a model. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْرَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهُ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ You have an example, a good example in, in the, uh, 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 the messenger of Allah, Muhammad, for those who want the hereafter. Uh, uh, second point, you know, Muhammad, so Muhammad had a history of uh, expansion. I mean, after he was... Uh, the underdog, if I, I can say sorry for the word, maybe I, I should uh, use another word for the sensitivity of the brothers uh, listening to me. Uh, before he was uh, persecuted, after he was persecuted in Mecca, he moved to Medina. So in Medina, he became a king, a crown, uncrowned king. And he had to kind of uh, do whatever it takes, you know, to survive and then carry on with his expansion to to co control Arabia. Then he, his followers went out of Arabia to to uh, uh, Syria and Egypt and Persia. So uh, what happened is that first Muhammad is a model, okay. Then what happened with uh, with uh, with the historical events? the abolish, uh, abolishment of the caliphate and the uh, lost glory, the Abbasids and everything, all this puts pressure on Muslims. It's a culture of shame and honor, you know. And add to this the crisis of Palestine, Kashmir, Punjab, Afghanistan, Chechnya, Andalusia, if I can add, really, Spain, and Iraq, too. I mean, this all puts pressure on, on Muslims because... They tried everything to, to regain the old glory. They tried everything. Now, they tried the Soviet Union. It failed. It, they tried to align with the West. It, they failed. The West, uh, they say, sides with Israel. Now, it's Islam is the answer. This is, I mean, the, the current ideology. Islam is the answer. Uh, now, does, is this built really on, uh, on uh, solid doctrine, uh, Really, in Islam, yes, Ibn Taymiyyah after the Imam Ibn Taymiyyah after the invasion of the Mongols called jihad the sixth pillar of Islam, and Ali uh, Ali bin Abi Talib uh, also you have a minute left, so so that we can move on said if, uh, if anybody uh, quits jihad, any people who quit jihad will be humiliated. You see, so. Uh, uh, all these points, it's, uh, Muhammad as a model, and the lost glory that uh, Muslims now are humiliated in, and the, the modern crisis, and they lost, they have no head, you know. The caliphate uh, went and never, never came back. They don't have a head of a nation, you know. So they are really humiliated, and this really puts pressure on them. And uh, the Quran says, if, uh, if you accept... Uh, any rule that's not from Sharia, from Allah, you will be disbelievers. Okay, but uh, let me ask you a quick follow-up question, and then we'll go to, uh, to, to Anjum. So most Muslims, um, not just in the West, but globally, they say that they are for living in harmony with other non-believers. Basically, just to summarize what you're saying, you're saying that this is not consistent with Islam, and it's because of what? Why, why do they believe the way that they believe it's, if it's not consistent with what, it, what Muhammad uh, lived out his life to be? Uh, any so-called moderate Muslim is a secular Muslim, I believe. The more devout the Muslim, the more extremist he or she becomes. I was myself with the Muslim Brotherhood when I, I felt that they are not enough. I, before I quit, I went to the Wahhabis and I joined the Wahhabi movement when it was nascent in Lebanon. So, I mean, a devout Muslim feels that they have to follow Muhammad. He is the example in life, you know. Okay. He, okay. Yeah.
Okay, very good. We, we have to move on. Again, tonight, uh, uh, tonight's topic is, is Islam a religion of peace? We want to touch upon three things, so we want to keep our answer short. One, uh, the objective of Islam. Two, the concept of jihad. Three, we'll go into um, the history of Islam. So, Anjum, we've discussed in the past that Islam's purpose is sort of twofold. One, to make it, a, uh, to make it the universal religion, and two, to create um, Islamic political states. Sort of briefly take us through the second goal so that our audience understands how Islamic law differs from Western legal systems and also how in Islam there is no distinction between what the West calls church and state. Yes, um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, good evening to your um, uh, listeners and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh for all of the Muslims who may be listening. Um, I must uh, in fact start with dealing with some of the issues which uh, the other speaker dealt with, although I do fully intend to deal with your question. First of all, I would like to invite uh, the two people who are uh, supposedly former Muslims to rediscover the truth and to embrace Islam and to come back to the light and the beauty of Islam and to leave the darkness that they have embraced instead of Islam. And I would like to invite all the other Christians who are originally non-Muslims as well to think about Islam as an alternative because uh, we are here to invite people to think about Islam as a way of life and uh, inshallah to save them in this life and in the hereafter. What well, I would say to you in terms of the definition of Islam, unlike what your previous speaker said, Islam is not based upon doctrine uh, which has its roots in politics or history. Rather, Islam is based upon uh, the revelation which came from Allah to Jibra'il salam, and which he sent to the messenger Muhammad wasallam, found in the inimitable Quran, and the example of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we follow that, that is something that we believe in. The Muslim is a Muslim because he believes in the Tawheed, which is the exclusive worship of Allah uh, in his life. He believes in that Tawheed, he lives by that, the Sharia, and he calls for it by way of Dawah and of course by Jihad. And what I would say to you is that um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the word Islam does not mean peace, as many people may think, the word Islam uh, means istislam, submission. Therefore, the Muslim is the one who submits his life to the command of Allah, hoping for reward in this life, but in particular, hoping for eternal salvation and paradise in the hereafter. And what I would say to you as well is that Islam uh, came to take people out of the darkness of man-made law and away from the misconceptions and the things which are entered into the religion of uh, the exclusive worship of Allah, which was uh, changed by the people after uh, Moses and after Jesus, so that he perfected the worship of the one true God. Now, dealing with your question specifically, um, yes, of course, Islam differs with secularism and Islam differs with uh, liberal democracy, as people like to call it nowadays, because uh, they uh, rest on the principle of give unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give unto God what is God's, whereas we believe that uh, the person in charge of the society needs to be a Muslim implementing the Sharia. And unlike what many people may believe, even some Muslims have misconceptions in this regard, Islam is not just about a purely spiritual belief. It has a spiritual dimension, but that spiritual dimension is the cognizance of Allah in every aspect of your life, whether in terms of ruling, economic, social, judicial, even the foreign policy of the Islamic State. So the Sharia needs to be implemented completely within society. That does not mean that uh, when we talk about politics, it's the politics that you have in the West, which is to say one thing before the elections and to do something completely different afterwards, or the politics of, politics of deception and, uh, if you like, of uh, deceit. Rather, the word siyasa in Arabic is a pure word, meaning to look after and to manage the affairs of the people on the basis of al-Islam, the divine law, to bring people out of the darkness of man-made law into the beauty and justice of Islam. So we will find, for example, that when the Sharia is implemented, Many of the ills within society, like pornography, gambling, alcohol, drugs, promiscuity, you know, the exploitation and the degradation within society would be eradicated. And what I would say to you is that this is not something which is purely theory. Rather, the Sharia was implemented for over 1,300 years from the time of the Messenger Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa the best man to walk the face of the earth, until 1924, when it was not dismantled by the Muslims, but rather the people who were the enemies of Islam and Muslims at that time, it happened to be the French and the British, dismantled the Khilafah, the Islamic State, and they put in place their own puppets who began to implement 
secularism and uh, obviously law, which was anathema to Islam and Muslims. But we find, in fact, that if we look at the Sharia when implemented, even in the heart of Europe, it was implemented in many places. Andalusia is a good example. But even if you look, for example, in the heart of Africa, countries like Sudan, Ethiopia, they used to export food and resources, and they were able to re relieve poverty in other parts of the world. And as you can well see, I'm sure your listeners will agree, that nowadays those very countries are you know, uh, with, uh, are begging with their begging bowls to others for help. And that is because of the exploitation of the capitalist system or ideology. So okay. I would say to you that uh, finally, if you want a summary, Islam uh, is a deen, not a spiritual or political belief. It's a deen which has a complete way of life, something we believe in, which we call Tawheed, live by the Sharia, and which we propagate and are willing to call for and even die for, we believe, by way of Dawah and Jihad. Okay, very good. Uh, Kamal, since Islam makes no distinction between church and state, going back to, to that um, idea, how is the existence of Islamic political states a threat to the current structure uh, of the West today? Well, we have to understand, number one, is uh, what uh, Brother Enjem said, that, uh, you know, they're trying to bring about Allah law, the law of God instead of law, you know, man-made law. If we look at Sharia itself, we found that Sharia itself, 60% of Sharia law is made from Hadith. And, uh, and from there, about 26% is Sira, and the rest is a Holy Quran. So therefore, when you look at the Sharia law, you'll find out the majority of it is Muhammad made. It is not made by Allah himself. So, And if we look at the life of Muhammad himself, how he lived his life, he was making up the story as they're going, and Allah was defending him after he did one mistake after the other. So therefore, it was a man living life, and Allah had to defend the man that he called. And so therefore, all the Muslim models their life after Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. And by doing so, therefore, what happened is it starts, you know, to be equal to human rights, but then uh, it comes about where it shuns everything and bring about death by the sword according to Sharia law. And if we look at what Brother Enjim said, you know, uh, he said there is no deception in Islam. As a matter of fact, the majority of the war of Islam were khuda. They were completely deceptive war. These were uh, Islamic uh, based on Muhammad, how Muhammad fought 26 of the battle that he went out there and deceived his enemy and how he deceived his enemy into different uh, situation to conquer them. So therefore, we find out the whole thing is based on deception by Muhammad himself, even in the beginning, and it was a Bedouin style, and all of it is pre-existed Islam, which is he inherited from his Bedouin tribe, the Quraysh, and he brought it with him to Islam, and he called it Islam later on. Bringing this law to Western civilization and a new model of freedom, and what so have you, of course, it's not going to agree, and it's going to divide between uh, the classes. So therefore, they must, they must declare that it is the holy uh, the belief and religion. The, the truth is, Muhammad, you know, uh, the Prophet of Islam, took many women himself. Uh, you know, it is the right of a Muslim man under the Hami status, under the law of war, to take women as sex slaves and uh, have sex with them, and even sell them, you know, after he had sex with them. So therefore, you know, it is in the Holy Quran, it's, uh, it's prescribed in Surah An-Nisa, and also in the Hadith Bukhari or Muslim, the 136 series, all of it over there. So if you call this is uh, Brother Enjim, if you call this is the religion of Allah, and you call this is a holy God-made law, then we have a problem in here because I can go and live uh, on a street and kill and rape and do all this and say, Allah, you know, God has commanded me. These are the laws that we're dealing with, which is they call it holy, and we are calling it it's not holy and it is uh, man-made and it is there is uh this is right now this is uh it's a laughter okay. it's something to laugh at R real quick pastor hisham show us where in the quran it, it calls to uh make islam the universal religion and then, and then we'll move on uh you know uh, it's not in one verse it, the, there are more than a hundred verses yeah, you can, see can you give and... us a few of those uh, let me see if, uh, uh, first, you, you know, the, the most powerful uh, verse about jihad 
when the sacred months and the, tw uh, the uh, which uh, uh, have passed, then kill the mushrikun wherever you find them and capture them and besiege them and prepare for them each and every ambush. But the hadith of Muhammad, as Brother Kamal was saying, always explains more, you know. I'm not picking that verse because I want really to distort Islam, but it's one of the most powerful, really, from Surah at tawbah 9. But uh, the hadith of Muhammad says, I've been commanded to fight against people till they testify there is no God but Allah, that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and they establish the, the prayer and pay zakat, and they, uh, if they do that, if they do it, their blood and property are protected. This is from Muslim. Uh, I have a few things to uh, uh, to answer, Brother Anjum, if, if there is time. Yeah, you, uh, you can go ahead real quick, but then we have to move yeah, around. Because uh, wherever, wherever I appear uh, talking to Muslim brothers, they try to practice character assassination, saying supposed to be converts or something like this. I want to say that I come from the tribe of Bani Makhzum, the tribe of uh, Quraysh. We trace the family to that tribe, and I challenge Brother Anjum that I can recite the Quran better than him. I used to memorize more than half of the Quran by heart. And, uh, and this character assassination goes nowhere, really. Then one point, which is very important point, we shouldn't mix between Christianity and the West. What he was talking about pornography and other stuff, you know, that's the Western culture is different from Christianity. Thank you very much. Okay, very good. Let, let's now move on to the concept um, of, of jihad, um, as it's revealed in the Quran, but also as it's interpreted by Muslims today. So I want to turn it over to uh, Ms. Anur. Um, the concept of jihad, take us through the, fir the, the four stages of it so that our audience understands it. I testify that there is none worthy of worship beside Allah and that there is that Muhammad is the final messenger of Allah. And I'd like to start just by also inviting everybody in the, in the studio uh, and the audience to find out about Islam and to come to a common word between us, the Muslims, and with the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians. Because we all agree that there is none worthy of worship beside God the one who created us all. And he is the only one who has any right to order us or forbid us or to make law or to say that something is lawful or unlawful or to decide what is good or what is bad for the people or what should be our objectives or our values or our morals. It cannot be in the hands of people to decide and override the will of God. And I want to mention as well because the, um, the, the priest that was speaking just a moment ago uh, noted the contradiction between the Western uh, values and the Western culture of pornography and, and drinking and gambling and all the other vice that they engage in um, and Christianity. And this is why I am a bit concerned. Why is it that when Islam is so much purer than anything we have in the West, why would a Christian choose to defend the Western values and the Western problems of society, the diseases they bring, I'm sure no Christian would agree with homosexuality or lesbianism or adultery or pornography. And yet Islam is the only one calling for any form of reformation in the world, in the laws and in the society to bring back that purity to the society. And I wanted to mention as well regarding the Sharia, because we've already started to talk about the Sharia of Islam. And you asked the question earlier, the purpose of Islam. And so I wanted to mention there are five purposes of the Sharia. The purpose of the Sharia, maqasid the Sharia, is to protect the deen or the religion of Allah, of God, of monotheism, to believe in only one God, and to prevent the worship of idols, to protect the life of the people, and to protect the honor of the people, and the wealth, and the mind of the people. These are the main objectives of the, of the Sharia. The and honor, uh, I, I have to cut you off because actually my question to you was to take us through the four stages um, of jihad, but, but since, since you brought it up, do you mean uh, the protection of which people, the Muslim people? All people in, a, in the society, Equally? whether Muslim or Zimmi, non-Muslim living under the Sharia. Protect them equally? 
I mean, we mentioned as well, yeah, about the right. um, the hadith saying that that the Prophet has been ordered to fight people until they say the they say the kalima la ilaha illallah. But also we have the verse of Tawbah saying that if people uh, from the non-Muslim seek your protection and seek a treaty or covenant with you to live in peace, then mm-hmm. accept them, protect them. And this is the situation with the jizya, with the zimmi, the people who live under an Islamic state, they will, they will be protected. They will be protected as citizens of an Islamic state under the sharia of Islam. Their mind, their wealth, their body, their life and their honor will be protected in a way that they never, they will never be protected in under Western law. It will never be protected under any other way of life. But aren't they, but, but, but aren't jihad, they protected right now? Are, aren't they protected Sorry? right? Aren't they protected right? Isn't everybody protected equally right now under Western law? Not at all. If you look to any country in the, in the West, especially, you will find that the minorities are always discriminated against. You will find that there are certain laws that but, are, but, are created. Okay, but you said the minority is always discriminated against. Yeah. Would it, in an Islamic state, wouldn't the minority be Jews and Christians, and the discrimination would be treating them as dimmies, right? But, but you're defining it. Notice, you're defining nothing, it as, uh, as protecting them. A question about the treating a zimmi as a zimmi because you cannot treat a non-Muslim as a Muslim. If you treat a non-Muslim as a Muslim, that would be injustice because a Muslim is obliged to pray. You will punish him if he doesn't pray. You can't ask a Jew to be punished if he doesn't pray like the Muslims or if he doesn't pay his zakat or if he doesn't fast in Ramadan. It's not their religion to do so. They're not obliged to do so. And so to treat non-Muslims and punish them for crimes that is only a crime for a Muslim to do is not fair and is that is injustice. So rather they are protected and their own life, if you look to the Muslim world, the oldest churches and the synagogues, the oldest temples of the mushrikeen, they are in the Muslim lands because they were never destroyed when Islam conquered. This is the difference. Yes, Islam would always expand and expand it all over the world quickly. And the people, they never left Islam. And even the non-Muslims who stayed there, they were happy to live under Islam in harmony and in peace. Why? Because when Islam expanded and invaded the country, they brought to them justice and took away the tyranny and the injustice. They brought to them fairness, took away the taxes, took away the oppression, and protected their life and their honor and their blood and their wealth, and protected them from outside um, attack, as well as the crime and the persecution within the, and the injustice within their own country. In comparison, when the Crusades were expanding all over the world, you found that they were murdering and killing and raping. And they even, when they, the, even Christian historians talk about when they entered Jerusalem, their streets were full, filled with blood and heads, and they were even roasting the children alive to, to, to eat them. This is the difference between um, a, a, a state which expands with violence and is spreading injustice and tyranny compared to Islam. Okay. When Islam, it would expand, it was expanding to remove the injustice and to establish justice in the earth where they've never seen it before. And I think Britain and America, okay. the Western world today, let they've me, never let, seen we any have justice to, We have to cut you off and, and hand it over to Kamal just, just for an opportunity to respond and then we'll come back to you. Go ahead and Kamal. Unfortunately, unfortunately, brother uh, Munzer Rahman, he didn't know how to answer the question, so he went on what he knows and what he teaches on. So uh, uh, I'm worried about this because he's coming to uh, something that he's avoiding completely and he's doing dawah in it. Uh, number two is, you know, the difference between Christianity, you know, and, and, and Islam. You know, Islam is still living by the word to wash your hand, wash your head, to do this much, whatever, by work. Therefore, whatever you do every day, you are living your life and you can be sinning, you can be hooked on pornography. And if you look at the majority of the oil country, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Bahrain, uh, Oman, you know, all of them, uh, the majority of them live in Europe and uh, Lebanon and different places. And we know how they live their life. They live in sin, which is sleeping with little boys and sleeping with girls and drinking and doing different things and gambling and living life. It's a horrible, horrible life. So when you're comparing, you know, Christianity to Islam, the Muslim are, you know, the hypocrite when it comes to that. How do I know? Because I live that life. Uh, the majority of the imam that I w- lived with uh, and worked with and worked under, they had double standard. You know, do what I say, don't do what I do. And uh, so when you're trying to contradict Christianity, and yet Islam itself, uh, with the leader's country, the, the one who uphold the Sharia law, Saudi Arabia, is the most deceptive and leading by deception. And when you look at all of them, one after the other, 
they are following in the same rank. Then you look at the, the uh, you know, the Christians live by the word. They don't live. They live according to their heart. What does that mean? Is where your heart is, where your treasure, you know, is. So you you live purely unto God because God tests the heart. And God made us in his image, man and woman. So we don't have to be slave, as Islam says, submission. We live as the children of God because God so loved his people that he gave them life and life abundant. So therefore, Islam comes about to bring about slavery. For example, what Brother Rahman did not mention in his Zimmi status, uh, status right there, it is legal for a Muslim man to take a non-Muslim woman. You know, if she's married to somebody and a Muslim man fell in love with her, it's okay. To take her away that's his legal rights according to demi status and also if uh, you know there are many 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 things if we look at egypt for example uh, if if a muslim man convert he, he's in jail and he's uh, he's put in jail and he's dead and if the christian people attest or do anything they are killed weddings funerals and, and what's uh, uh, and so on just on New Year's, they were praying. They bombed them over there. And when they protested on the street, they arrest them and throw them in jail. And they were punished because they're Christians. And you look at this, and it's happening all the majority of Muslim world. Look what's happening in Sudan. 10 million people were murdered by Islamic Arab sword that they came, migrated from Arab you know, nation and went into Sudan to butcher non-Muslims. And today, Sudan, in results, split the two nations. So when we look at what uh, uh, the brother just spoke, Abdul Rahman, uh, uh, Brother Rahman, uh, it is not just that, it's hypocrisy and it is, uh, it is bigotry what he's talking about. And that bigotry, you know, that he's putting Islam above all things, which is not true. Yes, the people of the Christian because they were born in America, they lived in America, just like you, wherever you're born. If you migrated to England and you want to change England, that's a different story. That's what we call it still jihad and deception, which is, Anjam said, there's no deception. Islam, yes, there is. Uh, many of them are migrating to change the Western culture. So we have to look at things straight in the eyes, and you could not speak into a double standard because that's a shameful word. Okay, we have to take a break. When we come back, we will continue the discussion. Is Islam a religion of peace? We will go into the concept of jihad um, and the four stages. Our number is 248-416-1300. Our lines are open, so call us here live in the studio here on ABN. We will be right back. Stay with us. These acts of violence against innocents violate the fundamental tenets of the Islamic faith. And it's important for my fellow Americans to understand that. The English translation is not as eloquent as the original Arabic, but let me quote from the Quran itself. In the long run, evil in the extreme will be the end of those who do evil. For that they rejected the signs of Allah and held them up to ridicule. The face of terror is not the true faith of Islam. That's not what Islam is all about. Islam is peace. Welcome back to Jihad Exposed. 
Quick announcement, this Friday, 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern, we will have a live debate here in the studio uh, with uh, between Robert Spencer and Mustafa Zayed. It's going to be a heated debate. That's this Friday, 8 p.m. Eastern. Make sure you stay tuned. Um, Anjum, let me pass the question back over to you. Um, take us through the four stages of jihad. Um, but after you, after you do that for us, talk to us a little about why there is diversity of opinion among the Muslim community on what exactly jihad means. Yes, um, <clears throat> obviously the word jihad is derived from the root word jihada, which is uh, to struggle. Therefore, um, obviously the word linguistically means to struggle maybe in your life, to struggle to worship Allah wa ta'ala in all aspects of your life. But juristically, the word jihad means to fight uh, in order to make the word of Allah the highest. And uh, that is what the classical scholars said. And the jihad in this, in this sense is two types. There is something called jihad dafi and jihad mubada, the defensive jihad and the offensive jihad. Nowadays, what is taking place in the world is defensive jihad, defending the life, honor, and property of the Muslims wherever it is being attacked. Uh, but uh, there's another type of jihad, which is called the jihad mubada, which is the jihad by an Islamic state to remove the obstacles in the way of implementing the Sharia. And here I would like to touch upon a couple of the things that your other speakers mentioned, um, uh, which is, for example, that under the Sharia, it is allowed for the Muslims to rape uh, non-Muslim women. This is completely nonsense. Uh, this is a lie. And uh, the fact that we like to enslave people, in fact, you find that the biggest force uh, to emancipate people, in fact, from slavery in the history of mankind was Islam, because for many issues, uh, the Quran and the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Free the slave, and uh, you know, to to um, if you like, free the slave as kafara, as penance for sins and things that you commit in your life." Therefore, many slaves were in fact freed, and it's a prohibited, in fact, to enslave someone. But you see, what is true, however, is that uh, you know, far from the Muslims raping uh, non-Muslims. We see, for example, that in Christianity, in the Christian world today, pedophilia is rife among the Catholic Church. This is something which your own priests admit to. And far from the Muslims enslaving people, you find that the biggest forces to enslave people throughout history were, in fact, the Christian European nations who took the blacks in Africa and even in America as slaves. In fact, the biggest genocide, I think, in, in, the, in the, the last couple of hundred years was the Americans for the indigenous Red Indian population. Millions of people killed in the name of Christianity, in the name of implementing their own way of life. So I think it's very rich, you know, for someone to try to level some kind of abuse and uh, accusation against Islam. And not only that, you see, uh, what we can see, you know, uh, some cheap, uh, if you like, attack to say that, you know, you can speak Arabic. I mean, Abu Jahl could speak Arabic, but uh, he'd been cursed and he's in the hellfire. So don't be proud of the fact that you're Qureshi. There are many mushriks, in fact, and from the time of the Prophet who are also Qureshi, and they are in the hellfire now. So I don't think that that is a good argument for you to bring against someone to say that you know Islam better. And what I would say is that, uh, you know, I think the important thing, if we're going to talk about this in a very healthy manner, is let us see what solutions uh, Christianity has for the problems that beset society. As my brother, Ms. Anna no, Rahman, quite we're not here. We're not, Anjum, we're not here comparing Christianity and Islam. You can, um, you can bring up the, the question, Islam is Islam a religion of peace from an atheist standpoint? You know, we're not here comparing the, the, the two religions. If you can go back on topic and talk about that defensive versus offensive jihad and, and help us understand when will we see offensive jihad take place, for example. Yeah, well, I mean, you see, one of the things that you need to appreciate is that... Um, uh, the jihad is a very noble duty. I mean, many things have been attributed to the mujahideen, which are completely false. And as an example, you know, the, uh, the mosques and the marketplaces which are being bombed, for example, in the northwest frontier of Pakistan, you know, in the border of Afghanistan, many of those are done almost exclusively by, you know, uh, American uh, bodies like Blackwater and ISI, who then blame the mujahideen in order to discredit them. Jihad is something which is to uh, remove obstacles uh, which are in the way of implementing the justice and the beauty of Islam. And that's why you find, for example, in our history, the Jihad Mubadaha, in fact, did not even need to take place. For example, countries like Indonesia, Ethiopia, Malaysia, they decided themselves to implement the Sharia instead of uh, the Muslim army having to come and remove the obstacles. In other words, the regime 
which is implementing the oppression of man-made law. So it's not about killing people. It's about removing oppression and making sure that the deen, the religion, is purely for the sake of Allah and that he is worshipped alone. And uh, we do not associate with him, with him anyone, whether it be Jesus or it be a cow or whatever people want to worship beside Allah. We want to bring people back to the true worship of the one true God and not to associate any partners with him. And we like to see that all over the world. And that is our dream, and that is what we work for, and that is the purpose of the jihad, you see. So I think that we need to purify it from the lies right. that people like to associate with it. Um, just, just a quick thing, and then I'll turn it back over. Uh, um, in the Quran, chapter 9, verses 5, it says, Slay the idolaters wherever you find them. Um, you said that it's not about killing. Can you help us understand this verse then? Well, you see, I mean, you have to look at the, t the verses in the context. When you're talking about uh, the jihad against those people, who are fighting against you, then uh, clearly that is something that uh, the Muslims need to respond to. And when you're talking about people who are showing animosity, so you, I don't think you will find an example anywhere in the history of Islam where the Muslims just went and started to kill people for the sake of killing them. Rather, Abdullah bin Umar, whom he said that the messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he never fought people until first he invited them to Islam. He invited them to live by the Sharia and to implement the divine law when they refused that he removed the obstacles in the way of implementing the Sharia. So you find, for example, that um, uh, in, the, in the example of the Battle of Badr was an excellent example. When he took the hostages, he, he ransomed them by uh, getting them to teach Arabic, and after that, many of them may in fact embrace Islam. So I don't think that you can, you can say that Islam is there to coerce people to become Muslim. I mean, a good example, in fact, is Yvonne Ridley. She was all the way in Afghanistan. She was captured by the Mujahideen, and she embraced Islam. I make a, make a comparison between that and, in fact, people who are in the West being tortured in Guantanamo Bay, in Abu Ghraib, in Bagram Air Base. There's a world of difference between what people do in the name of Christianity and secularism and how the Muslims treat their prisoners who, in fact, end up embracing Islam. I don't think you'll find that the Muslims are committing the genocide and the torture that is being perpetrated in the name of Christianity, in the name of having a crusade against Islam and Muslims that we see all around us in the world today. Okay, let, let me turn it to Pastor uh, Hisham to, to respond to that. Go ahead. Yes, uh, uh, Brother Anjam and uh, Mizan al-Rahman are, are offering us uh, uh, slavery and humiliation instead of dignity. Uh, the problem, I agree with him about the verse about uh, the idol worshippers. That, in context, is for the Meccan idol worshippers. However, if you go through... Chapter 9, okay, 929, okay, this is a verse uh, also uh, Brother Mizan did or did not really finish or did not quote. Uh, I'll read it first in Arabic. I'm not proud bec because Arabic is my mother tongue, but I just say, I'm just saying that uh, don't doubt that I was a Muslim for 24 years. قاتلوا الذين لا يؤمنون بالله ولا باليوم الآخر ولا يحرمون ما حرم الله ورسوله ما حرم الله ورسوله ولا يدينون دين الحق من من الذين أوتوا الكتاب حتى يعطوا الجزية عن يد وهم صاغرون I'll read it in English. Please. Fight those who believe not in Allah nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden, which has been forbidden by Allah and his apostle, nor acknowledge the religion of truth of the people of the book until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Wahum sagirun, Subdued, right. humiliated, submitted. Let me say, uh, go back to the uh, dynamics of jihad. Jihad is fard kifaya, if the Muslim nation is sovereign. Fard kifaya means if some do it, it, it doesn't really apply to others. Uh, they don't have to do it. Uh, but if the Muslim land is under occupation, like Israel, Palestine is under Israeli occupation, Iraq under American occupation, Kashmir under Indian occupation, Chechnya, etc., uh, all Muslims are living in sin if they don't fight till the liberation of it's fard, it becomes fard kifaya. As he said, I, I appreciate his frankness. Uh, Mubadara, he said, becomes defensive jihad. So it's fard ain. So really not really whitewash things, you know. Always 
uh, our brothers in Islam, they, they really stop at half of the verse. The other half that Brother Mizan stopped at when he said, uh, come to the, to the common word, common terms. Uh, as it says in uh, Ali Imran, Surah 364, okay? But, uh, come to common terms, but then it says, فَإِن تَوَلَّوا فَقُولُوا شَهَدُوا بِأَنَّ مُسْلِمُونَ Okay, if then they turn back, say ye bear witness that we at least are Muslims. So there is always, you know, this call, da'wah, you know. Okay. Uh, they don't believe that Muslims are equal. إِنَّ شَرَّ الدَّوَابِ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا They believe that non-Muslims are worse than animals. So if you lie to a dog, there is no problem. You're lying it to a dog. I don't accept, by the way, uh, Brother Kamel's uh, uh, statement about uh, a, a Christian or Jewish woman being, uh, you know, uh, halal or can, can a Muslim can allow to take her. I haven't seen that in Sharia. I, I'll ask for evidence later, maybe. Thank you very much. Okay, let me turn it to uh, Rahman. Did, he, did Pastor Hisham um, quote 929 in context? Because then that would... Um, that would basically prove what you were saying, that it's not about killing or, or violence or anything like that, but it's protecting people. This simply says, fight against. So, I mean, can you comment on that for us? Yes, the verse that he's quoting is Ayat to safe the verse of the sword, and it was the final word on the jihad, the final revelation talking about the jihad. And it, it highlights the relationship between the states, the Muslim state and all other states is that if there is no treaty between them, between the non-Muslims and the Muslims, then there is a state of war. Just like with any other nation, if there's no treaty between them, then, it is, then they are liable to fight each other. And in the same case with the Muslim nation and the other non-Muslims around the world, they can live with it in, in peace if they pay the jizya. And I'm sure the jizya is nothing compared to the taxes that we pay in Britain or in America. We pay a half, most of us pay a third or fourth or half of our wealth yeah, to, the, to the government for nothing. And this is nothing compared to, um, you know, the jizya is nothing compared to this. Rather, the jizya it is a protection for their life and a protection for their wealth and a protection for everything, and it stops any fighting against them. That's why Umar ibn Khattab, when he passed away, he gave a will to the people, and he said, that, let the one after me be fair with the zimmi and to never to break their covenant and to protect them and to defend them because that is what the, the, the jizya is for. And they must be subdued, yes. They must obey the law of the land. You cannot live in a country and just say, because I'm not Muslim, I can steal and I can rape. No, they need to obey the law. You can't just have a law of the jungle. If okay. you're living in a country, Rahman, you're living in the streets. Rahman, the just guarantees... time, up, time, up, time up for one minute. Let me ask you a follow-up question and then I'll hand it back over to you. If, let me ask you to play devil's advocate for one minute. If you were a non-Muslim, how would you view paying jizya? How do you compare paying jizya with paying taxes to a government? From a, from a non-Muslim's point well, of view, yeah. not, not a Muslim's point of view. Sure. From a human being point of view, if one person has to pay a third of their wealth or half of their wealth purely because they are earning or because they have a business, that is injustice, is a tax. Whereas if you are paying uh, a jizya tax to be exempt from any form of fighting, from any for form of army service, from any form of conscription, and to be protected for your life from any attack, and you're exempt also from paying as a cat, like the Muslims, because the Muslim pays a cat. Yes, but you're also implementing, but, 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 but again, so from a, from a non-Muslim's perspective, you are forcing that human being who believes that Islam, that religion, is a man-made religion to be subjugated, or what Pastor Hisham said, subdued under some religion that they care not to even live under, right? So what would you say about uh, myself, Muslim? I was born in Britain, I grew up in Britain, and I don't agree with the democracy. I don't agree with parliament. I don't agree with the laws in this country. Mm -hmm. However, the government still expects me to obey the law and to be submitted right, but, whenever the police right, orders me. They but me the, government, but the government the expects you to do it. The, the government expects a Christian to do it. The government expects an atheist to do it. He's not, the, the government is not putting a Muslim or, or the, the Muslim population in a position of being the minority. You're equal like everyone else. But wouldn't you agree that if 
the West became an Islamic state, you're forcing the rest of the population to be subjugated under a law that you're like isolating everybody else to be under a law that they, that they don't believe in. Not the case, because men and women, they will have the same laws. Just as Muslims are not allowed to steal, non-Muslims are not allowed to steal. There is not a separate law for the Muslims that they can steal and the others can't. And it's not fair just because the, the, uh, they are uh, different. Yes, we don't believe that Muslims are equal to non-Muslims in terms of virtue and their piety, but that doesn't mean that one is allowed to oppress the other. And so the but, but you, you, are, you, are oppress, on... you are oppressing the other when you're forcing them to pay the jizya. How is that not oppression? It's like, it's like it, let's say in Christianity, it's like for, um, if, if Christianity had something similar to that, paying, if it was a Christian country and um, they had, you know, Christianity forced a jizya. It's like forcing you to pay a tax to, to, to live under this land, but only a Muslim to, to live under this land. It doesn't make sense. How does it make sense? Well, what happens for any citizens at all, if they want to live in a country and they don't pay the taxes, they'll be put in prison. They'll be, they'll be persecuted, they will be, um, they will be arrested, or they'll be punished. And under Islam, the Muslim, they do not pay jizya, but they will pay zakat. And the zakat could be much more than that. Not only that, there are, among the non-Muslims of Zimni, it's only a certain, certain people among them who will pay the jizya. The women do not pay jizya. Children do not pay jizya. The elderly do not pay jizya. Whereas the, in, uh, in secular countries, all of these people will pay tax. All so, of these people will give away a lot of their wealth for, no, so, for nothing at all, for, for nothing in return. Okay, so, so in summary, would you, would you then agree with um, Islam being a religion of peace only if, um, in, a, in an Islamic state, if all were to abide by its um, laws of subjugation? Well, I'm sorry, but I don't see how you can have a state or people living in a society together, living between each other, without to abide by the law of the land. You can never have harmony or peace where people do not believe that they have to li live by a, a law. If people believe that they can do whatever they like just because they don't agree with the religion of the state, just as I don't believe in atheism, I don't believe in secularism, and that is the religion of the state, is to be secular, is to have no, uh, have no uh, link to God in the legislation. But I don't believe in those laws. And yet, if I break the law, I don't have any excuse. I'm being forced to do so, even if it breaks my, my religion. Even if I'm, even uh, the Muslims in um, France or in Belgium, they're not allowed to wear the burqa. They're not allowed to come out with their own religion. And nobody else is being forced to, to leave their religion or to contradict their religion. In Britain or in America, a Muslim will be punished for doing things a non-Muslim will never be punished for. A Muslim, if he was to, if he was to uh, play paintball or to go camping, they'll be accused of terrorist training and they'll be put behind bars. If a Muslim goes to a protest and was to criticize or question the Western government or the secular government, they will be put in prison. Whereas a non-Muslim can, can criticize Islam all they like. They can swear against Muhammad or Islam, and they'll never be punished. So there is a draconian legislation directed specifically at a minority, for the Muslims specifically. And yet we're still expected to abide by that. And so I don't think there is any kind of, um, there, there's no uh, contradiction here at all. Rather, the justice is, is in, in, with Islam. In Islam, you will not be forced to uh, do what the Muslims do. You will not be forced to pray and to do what is specific for Islam. But the law of society protects the life of the people and the honor of the people and the wealth of the people to prevent theft, to prevent rape, to prevent adultery, to prevent the murder. These laws must be obeyed by all members of the society. And if people don't obey that law, then how can you have peace? And okay. when you find Let that there's never Kamal, been... Kamal I, want, I want you to comment and then we will take our first call of the evening. Go ahead. You know, uh, we, we have to look at everything, you know, again, we're dealing here with hypocrisy. Uh, we're dealing with uh, world Islam genesis against the world. And uh, the genesis is they trying to, uh, if you look at the world issue today, according to the Gallup report, 97% of the world issues are Islamic, whether in Europe, whether in Russia, East Europe, uh, the whole world. And today, you know, as you, you hear uh, Brother Mazur Rahman and what he said, you know, it is really hypocrisy. Why, why Christians or Jews need protection when they're under a, a Muslim protection? Why do they need to pay jizya for protection? This is almost like uh, uh, the Italian law, you know, like when, uh, you know, if, uh, 
if you do this for me, I will do this for you. You know, protection come only by monies, you know, like the mafia, as we call it in the United States of America. So therefore, uh, I don't see if, if Muslim are strong enough to protect non-Muslim, why they need to ask them to pay. That's number one. Number two, uh, the law has been set in England and been bought and uh, bought by blood and put together. And, and people just like uh, Brother Rahman, they come, you know, and they uh, brought to, to, to England for specifically to penetrate a civilization like United Kingdom to say, I don't agree with those laws, but these laws were there even before you're born. So therefore, if you want to practice, you know, and bring about Islamic law that you want, you can practice them in an Islamic country. Why do you have to enforce them upon anyone in anywhere in the world? As a matter of fact, we're dealing here with world genesis. Uh, the Gallup report and the Pew report did st uh, statistics in Europe. It is done by the rape of the, the multitude of rapes that are done by Muslim men uh, against European women. You know, you can Google it, you can check it out. And as far as, you know, about the raping of the women, uh, it is... You know, it is against Islam to rape the Muslim. It's against the Muslim belief to rape Muslim women. But Muhammad, according to the Quran, verse 4 and 24, the apostle of Allah, he said uh, on occasion in the battle, in the battle of Hunayna, he said, they met their enemy and fought with them and defeated them and took them captive. And then it went from there and he said, what did what do we do with the women? How can we sleep with them without get them impregnated? These are the one we want as booties, you know, as as a, you know, as war. And he said, "Are you serious?" He said, "Sleep with them. It is better to sleep with them and and then sell them." This is in Surah 424 as well, and and Hadith al Bukhari, uh, 34 and 432. These are on uh, on occasion by Muhammad, the Apostle of Islam, time and time again. These are the account that we're dealing with today, that uh, the invasion of our world, that they come in to the Western civilization and trying to say the Christian are doing this. As a matter of fact, America is not a Christian country. Uh, America is a country of many faces, but yet they said Guantanamo Bay, Ach Enjem, Brother Enjem said that that's what the Christian are doing. Brother Enjem, you're a smart man. You should not say something like this because this is something completely different. It's just like you're saying, you know, Muslims are doing this uh, as Al-Qaeda, you know, killed somebody in Russia. You know, uh, this is bigotry again against Christians. Uh, we need to think smart and get out of that mode because now you're accusing Christianity and it is jealousy and heresy again, you know, in every way that you're applying to this. Uh, Again, the issue here, it's Islam is not a religion of peace. Islam is a religion of war. Al-Islam is a government and it is, uh, it is a religion. So therefore, everything must come about in Islam to be conquered according to what Muhammad did and modeled, Muslim modeled herself in jihad in murdering humanity to bring about Islamization uh, of the world, and then they can bring about peace. And that peace is by the sword of Islam. Okay, we have to take our first call. Before we take our first call of the night, if you have any questions, if for whatever reason you don't get through to the lines, you can actually email us your questions. We're going to be checking the email all night, um, and then we will get back with you. You can email us to jihadexposed at abnsat.com. Who do we have on air with us tonight? Welcome to the program. You're live on ABN. We are having some audio issues with that caller. Please do call us back. Let's take our next caller. You're live on Jihad Exposed. Hello? Yes, welcome. Hey, what's good, Summer? How you doing? Uh, I'm doing very good, thank you. What's your question for us? Well, I, I got a couple of statements and then a, uh, two quick statements and then a question. Number one, I bear witness that there's no God but the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jesus is his son. Um, and I just want to make that clear. Number two, um, I keep hearing the Muslims talk about how an Islamic society will be better than a, a Western society and a secular society. And I'm not here to, uh, to defend Western, the Western society. The secular society will be dealt with by God and his time. But the problem with, with Sharia is that they want to create a government, a theocracy, with sinful men um, imposing this law. 
So they say that, oh, the, the non-Muslim will be protected, the non-Muslim will be given rights, but human nature being what it is, when you have Christians and Jews surrounded by a sinful, fallen Muslim, they're going to discriminate, they're going to wrongly accuse them, they're going to create lies, they're going to they're gonna murder them. And it, ha- it happens all around the world. And, of course, Anjum and the other guy, they say, well, there's no real example of, of a Muslim society on earth. But there is. What you have are sinful men trying to do God's will without their heart being changed. And the last thing I want to say is, years ago, I received a vision of, of the Messiah. Jesus came to me in brilliant light, and all I could do was shake I, I, and, and just and, and worship him uh, and, and, and shudder. And he spoke words, and his voice was so powerful that it just it, it went into my very soul. And we have examples throughout the Muslim world, throughout the Muslim countries, of Muslims receiving visions of, of, of Jesus, of Isa, of Yeshua coming to faith, and I just want to let you know that the voice I heard, the power behind that voice, would crush the enemies of God. And I want to ask Anjum and the other gentleman, um, Rahman, what will they do when they stand before the King of the Jews? What will you do when you stand before the Messiah of the universe and you give an account for your sins? You, 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 you know, you, you may even have privy to plans, to plots, uh, to destroy the West, and that's fine. God is sovereign. But what are you going to do when you stand before the King of the Jews? Because he's not going to let you slide with your idolatry, with your rejection of him, and with your lies. And his blood, uh, his, the Bible says when he comes back, his robes will be splattered with the blood of his enemies. What are you going to do when the lamb becomes the lion? That's all i got to ask them, and I would love to get their answer on that. Okay, very good. We will actually take a break, and then I will um, hand it over to Enjem for that. But actually, while you were talking, I, um, Enjem, you always say that Islam is submission to the will of Allah. Kamal, would you say that Christianity is submission to the will of God? Because we hear this word submission, submission, and then tonight we've sort of um, put together Islam versus the Western Christianity. And so, yeah. you know, if we, if we take Christianity out of it, and my, my hope was to approach the question from a sort of non-biased perspective, not, from a, not necessarily from a Christian perspective, but just is Islam a religion of peace? Um, but because the, 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 uh, the word submission keeps coming up, I mean, isn't from a Christian's perspective, if they are a consistent Christian, isn't their life still a submission to God? Uh, abs- absolutely, you know, the Christians still are living for God. Nevertheless, in Christianity, God gave us the free will to live and serve Him or uh, to live our free uh, free life. The Word of God in the book of Revelation says He's standing on a door, uh, outside the door, knocking every day to be invited to come and dine in. So therefore, He is waiting for obedience, and that obedience is not by the sword or by josia, you know, penalty taxation, or by intimidation, or by fear, or by chopping head. It is by love, because God so loved the world that He gave freedom to humanity to love Him back, and that's why God created us uh, in such manner and this is why brother Hisham and I converted from uh, Islam to Christianity and both of us were radical Muslim but when we had an encounter with Jesus Christ the Messiah and he called us to his grace and mercy and his love which is there is no other God beside him and he is Lord of Lord and King of Kings the mighty one and now all humanity, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, you know, just like the brother on the phone says, you know, uh, what say you, Anjem? What say you, Rahman? When you find out it is not so, there's no Allah over there. And um, maybe Satan lied and says, well, I made the whole story up and you followed. And uh, you know what? I showed you in the Quran how it is, but you never listened. Uh, I never made it clear for you and you're still guessing until this day. And you're still trying to put the world to submission because you yourself oppressed. Okay, we will take a break and we'll come back to Anjem. Stay with us. We'll be right back. <laughs>
If you are a user on Facebook, ABN would be happy to add you as a friend. Simply search ABN Sat and add us as a friend. After doing so, send and we will approve your request. ABN loves to add new members, so find us and we hope to see you soon. Jihad has come to America. It constitutes the most devastating series of terrorist attacks in history. The only deen Allah accepts is Al Islam. And whoever seeks any other deen apart from Islam will never be accepted. And we stand together to win the war against terrorism. Welcome back to the show, live here on Jihad Exposed. Last 30 minutes, make sure you call if you have any questions for our panelists. Our number is 248-416-1300. And Jim, I'll turn it right over to you um, if you uh, feel comfortable answering that question of the past caller. Uh, remind me about the question again. Um, he said, if you are wrong for whatever reason, if, you, if, if Islam is a false religion and um, the moment that you die, you stand in front of God and um, you know, the, the, the God of Christianity is, was and always has been um, the true religion. What will you say? I mean, what, what are you going to do at that point, basically? Well, I mean, this is a purely hypothetical question, and uh, I don't think that is uh, worth my while answering. I believe that Allah created us to worship Him, and He sent His messengers, including Jesus and Moses and the final messenger, Muhammad, uh, وسلم, away from worshipping the creation, uh, and each other to worshipping the true Lord, which is Allah. And I think it's quite interesting that, um, you know, the strongest argument uh, that Christians usually present is that I saw the light. And obviously it's very difficult to argue with someone because, you know, anyone can claim I saw the light, you know, and, um, you know, I mean, I don't want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, make too much of uh, a jest of it, but, um, you know, I mean, you know, you're wasting a lot of electricity. You know? <laughs> Maybe you should turn the light off and, and uh, you know, deal with the reality. I think that what we need to do is we need to look at the inimitability of the Quran uh, on a serious note, and we need to look at the finality of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and stop uh, this philosophical ideas of I saw this, or I saw that, which nobody can prove or disprove. What we can prove is that the Quran is still in the same way that it was revealed to the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam even today. Nobody uh, changed it. No one had their finger on it. Whereas the Bible, you can see there are many different versions and no one can really agree on a standard. And it was never written down contemporaneously. This is one of the reasons why the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came in order to deal with the misconceptions and the contradictions within the Bible. Wait. You know, interestingly, interestingly, if I just didn't make this one point, mm -hmm. the first person to say that I saw the light was, of course, the arch enemy of Jesus Christ and uh, the disciples, which is Paul, who used to be Saul. And he is the one who introduced many things which, in fact, did not exist within Christianity before, like the original sin, like someone, you know, uh, taking your confession and, uh, uh, the, you know, uh, uh, dying on the cross and many things, which, in fact, um, I think that uh, we need to go back to the true teachings of Isa, Islam, Jesus, which were confirmed by the Messenger Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, uh, can, can you just clarify one thing? You said you cannot prove what is true. What, what, what do you mean by that? Well, I'm saying that, uh, you know, if we just uh, think about things in terms of abstract, uh, uh, um, you know, experiences, you know, I saw the light, you know, I'm feeling it in my heart. You know, obviously anyone can say that. The, in the, 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 the Sikhs, the Hindus, the communists, everybody says, you know, I'm feeling good. I'm sure the, uh, the prisons are full of people who felt very so, good about their so, crimes. So you, your belief uh, system is on facts is what you're saying? But no, what we need to do is we need to look at the uh, divine text to see if this is really something which came from God and it was preserved and uh, if, that, if that is something that we can rely upon. And therefore, I think that if we go back to the root uh, yeah, but, text... But, but, but go, again, the, going back, based, based, on, based, on, based on what, again, um, are, are, are you... Because the caller's question was, what if you're wrong? So my question to you is, yeah, what, really, what if... What if just, just let, let me finish my question and, and then I'll hand it to you. Based on what are you making the conclusion that the religion of Islam is the true Islam? Is it based on facts? 
Well, what I would say to you, you know, what you could ask me the question, what if, uh, you know, we were all uh, created by aliens and in fact, you know, one day we're going to be sucked up by a so, big so, spaceship. Okay, so, so, so I'm summarizing that, that it's a hypothesis that you're making, is that true? I think it's nonsensical that, you know, God uh, had a son, you know, and therefore he got children and, you know, he loved him so much that he killed him. No, but so one minute, you, you didn't answer. You, you didn't answer my question. My, my, my question was based on what is, based on why did you make the decision that, you, that you're following Islam? Based on what? Well, based upon the fact that I believe in the inimitability of the Quran, I believe that the, this challenges mankind to do something similar. Yes, but similar. Your, your, your belief is based on what? My belief is based upon the Quran. The, the way that it sounds, the impact it has on the human being, the fact that it does not contradict any facts of science or history or mathematics. It is a numerical miracle. It is a scientific miracle. It affects uh, so, okay, uh, the person. So, so, okay, two things. One, you say the way that it sounds. Isn't that emotion? You're, all you do is criticize um, Christianity and Christians because it's based on emotion. Two, um, this is just because I'm interested. Two, you say it's based on science and facts and so forth and, and mathematical. If somebody were to approach you and provide you facts and science and, and data to disprove Islam, would you be willing to question Islam? If, uh, if somebody could find one fact in the Quran which contradicts with reality, and by the way, you know, I study medicine, so, you know, you can't, uh, you know, uh, pull the wool over my eyes about scientific contradictions. Didn't, I can didn't you study law as well? So, did, facts did, did... in the Quran. Wait a second, can I just finish? And I will say to you that um, when we talk about the sound and the impact and the linguistic challenge, that is a challenge, a practical one. If someone can do something similar, a verse or, uh, you know, a surah of the Quran, then, you know, uh, you know, I'll be quite willing to say, fair enough, the challenge has been met. But right. nobody right. for 1,432 years has been able to do that, you know, uh, uh, throughout the history. So, ever so, since the time. So, 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 you are, so you are willing to question Islam if somebody were to provide you a fact. Well, well, so, so, so but does, does that even, isn't, isn't that, is that contradictory to what Sharia teaches to even question Islam itself? Wait a second, wait a second, sir. Let's, let's just have a look at exactly what I'm saying. I believe that the Quran uh, is uh, a challenge which is unbeatable. I believe the Prophet is messenger of Allah. And I, 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 you know, I believe in that. But I, you know, I believe that I'm right. But, you know, the Muslim is the one who says, look, you know, I believe I'm right. But, you know, if you believe that what you have is correct, let us have an open debate and discussion. There's nothing on the program today at all which inclines me in any way whatsoever to anything other than Islam. In fact, I'm more convinced and I'm more firm in what I believe when people start to say, I saw the light or I saw this as their main argument. I think other people, you know, inshallah, will also no, but, be embraced. But, but put that aside. Put, 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 put that aside, right? I, let's go back to it because we have about 20 minutes on the show, show left. You, you said if somebody provides you a fact to question Islam, uh, I'm sorry, if somebody provides you a fact that will contradict the basic tenets of what you believe um, in the religion of Islam, then you would question your belief in Islam. Right? Let's say that it doesn't exist, but uh, well, it's a, it's that, that's your belief system. But if somebody were to provide you, would you be willing to question it? You said yes. Wait a second. Wait a second. But, but isn't, that, isn't that in itself it is, going against is, what Sharia uh, teaches to question the religion? Look, Sam, it is a hypothetical question. You know, if someone, uh, uh, you know, were trying to convince me that, uh, you know, the sun is not really in the sky, you know, it's, it's not reality. It doesn't happen. Fact is, you know, let's deal with reality. Try to find any contradiction in the Quran. Anything which contradicts with the facts of science has been proven, not hypo hypothesis or theories like evolution, you know, that our great-great-grandfathers were gorillas or monkeys. I don't think anyone's got a picture of a gorilla on his wall to say that was my great-great-grandfather. And until they do, you know, I'm not willing to believe that. So let's deal with reality and fact. I believe in Islam. I believe in the Sharia. So if anyone wants to contradict that and they want to try to challenge that, I'm happy to have an open debate and discussion. But let's not deal with theories. You know, if on the Day of Judgment we find out that we're all supposed to be worshiping cows, you know, I don't think that we're going to we're going to swallow that kind of argument. I don't okay, think let, let's well. leave, let's leave it at that and move on. But a quick announcement, actually, while we're on this topic, Anjum will be back in February to debate uh, David Wood on the question of uh, would uh, would Sharia help the West? That's coming in February live on ABN. We'll keep you posted on those details. Uh, let's take our next call right now. You're live on Jihad Exposed. Welcome. You're live on ABN. Who do we have on air with us? Uh, hello. Yes, welcome. Hi, Sister Summer. How are you? Good evening, gentlemen all. Uh, I have a question for, uh, for Brother Anjum. Yes, go right if ahead. Speak, uh, 
Uh, if he can listen to me, please, carefully, okay? Uh, uh, I'm not going to ask you too much, too much harsh one, but I'm going to ask you a very personal one in terms of Quran. You just said that I am so satisfied. She asked you, what is your basis? What was your satisfaction in, in Quran to become a Muslim? A Muslim that, uh, I'm going to ask you this question. In terms of Quran, don't you have a self-sense of yourself that all these traps, all these all these terrorism happen to the world. It'll come from Quran and people they are doing according to Quran. This is my question. And I'm not saying that you have to abandon Islam. Be Muslim, but think about your eternity. Eternity in Quran, I challenge you if you can show me a one word it says there's salvation the end of you when you when you leave this world and you're going to go straight in heaven with muhammad according to quran but i i i, I challenge you uh, one million percent if you are a pure muslim you're satisfied with your religion show me one word that is going to be a safe place for you for your particular you brother Anjum. Because you sound very nice guy, and you talk very logical. And believe me, I am satisfied with you as a humanity. You are my brother in humanity. And I feel sorry for you, not because you are Muslim. Your brain is being sealed with nonsense. Because think about your eternity, Brother Anjum. Think about your eternity. Where are you going to go after when you leave this world? Okay. After when you leave this world. Forget about all these things happen. Think about yourself. And I challenge you, if you are really pure Muslim, show me one word in Quran that says you will be safe with me while you kill somebody and kill, and kill yourself and kill innocent people with you. You are welcome in my heaven. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you. Anjum, did you hear that question? You know, I think that, uh, you know, a question is only really a question if it has an answer. And, uh, you know, I think your your uh, guest, uh, he wasn't really making a, a question there. He was really on a bit of a, on a, bit of a, a rant, you know. And uh, at the end of it, I think what he's saying is, what does it say in the Quran that if you engage, for example, in a martyrdom operation or engage in jihad, that Allah will give you Jannah? You know, and I would say to him, uh, look, for example, in chapter Tawbah, uh, I believe uh, verse 9111, where Allah said in the Quran, Allah 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 He said, he said uh, Allah has purchased from the believers their life and wealth, and in return He has promised them paradise. They kill others and are killed. This is the main verse that people use in order to sacrifice their life for the sake of uh, the jihad. But obviously there has as well, you know, uh, explanation. For example, the, some of the Mufassirin said that if you jump among the enemy, hoping to take some of them, you know, in order to, uh, you know, fight when you're in the battlefield and you die, for example, one person among a thousand, then that is the way you sacrifice your life for the sake of Allah. But remember, the jihad is not just about killing yourself. And the other thing I would say to him is that, yes, of course, when I look at the Quran, and I uh, uh, hear the verses, it has an impact upon me, on my heart, uh, upon my mind, you know, and, uh, and obviously it will affect me a lot. And that is one of the things, to, you know, which inclines me towards it. But I don't just rely upon, you know, something which is not tangible. I also look at the Quran. I know, for example, the Quran was written down contemporaneously. It was copied. People memorize it. It's very easy to remember, which is why your priest, obviously, uh, the, the one who, you know, who said he used to be a Muslim, can recite some of the verses of the Quran because it's very easy to remember. It's not like the Bible, apart from the fact that people are changing the Bible all the time. You cannot really remember it as well, you know, and he can even, uh, you know, melodiously recite it. So th those are some of the things which make me convinced about the Quran, but there are many others as well. Uh, the complete solution, how is it a book, just 6,600 odd verses, was able to give a, a constitution and provide solutions for humanity from the time of the Prophet all the way to today and will indeed until the Day of Judgment. Whereas if you look at the laws, for example, in America and Britain, you only need to go to the House of Commons and you find rooms full of laws, and yet they cannot make up their mind about simple ways in which to organize the society. This is the judicial miracle of the Quran, which, uh, you know, having studied law, like I studied medicine, I can tell you Islam is far superior 
to the judiciary in Britain, in America, and in other parts of the world because it provides solution and it does not need to keep changing because it is perfect. Okay, let, let me turn it over to Pastor Hisham for your comments. First, uh, I want to clarify uh, the comment about Brother Kamal that uh, the rules of battle are different from the rules of peace. The Prophet of Islam, uh, during, when he attacked uh, the Jews in Khaybar, he uh, took uh, Safiya for his wife after killing her father and brother and husband. So uh, he called her the mother of the believers, and they have a justification for that because he wanted to free her brothers and cousins, etc. But imagine somebody mourning the death of his father, brother, and husband, 17 years old, to be taken as a wife. That's, I mean, uh, really, uh, sorry to say, rape. Uh, I, I want really to, to go to, to the gist of the matter, really, to jihad again. Mm -hmm. uh, and because we really drifted from the subject. And this is uh, very important because it bears in our life today. Muhammad started, was persecuted in Mecca, then he moved to Medina, became there a, a king and a warrior, and a prophet, quote-unquote, at the same time. He con conquered most of Arabia. Then his first successor, Abu Bakr, ha had to fight uh, thousands of Muslims because they denied him zakat. They refused to give him the alms, which is a pillar, pillar of Islam. So he killed thousands of Muslims because they denied they refused to give him uh, zakat, you know. Then Umar, the second successor of Muhammad, I'm talking about a legacy here, a legacy. Uh, Anjum and uh, the other brother, they are fighting against history, against the legacy of Islam. Umar, Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam said, if there is a prophet after me, it will be Umar. And uh, Umar, his three statements of his ended up in the Quran. This is a very well-known fact. Let's not fic mix fiction with fact here. Uh, Omar, when he took over, he, drew, he uh, decided to cleanse Arabia of, of non-Muslims. He, he cleansed Arabia and uh, he said the Arabs are the material of Islam, al-Arab madda to Islam. So instead of fighting each other, they can fight their neighbors. So he, instead of raiding, raiding each other, let's raid their neighbors. So they went out in, in, in raids. And uh, it's not only Umar, Muhammad at his deathbed sent uh, Ghazwat al usra led by Osama bin Zayd to, to the uh, frontiers of, of Syria. So Umar, when he took over, there is something called al uhd al umariya the Pact of Umar. Christians are not allowed to uh, uh, refurbish churches. They are not allowed to maintain their church. Church, churches have to die down. There are many things uh, uh, are retained from the days of Umar. He's not responsible for all the, the articles in al ahd al-Umari. As a historian, I know that it, they were added later, but but it's uh, called after him because he, he drove every non-Muslim out of Arabia. And even though he refused to pray in Kanisa to Qiyamah, uh, the, the Church of the Resurrection, however, he put restrictions on Christians so that they will not be able to share the gospel with, with the Muslims. So uh, persecution has been there since, ter since uh, Islam started. And what we see in Egypt today uh, um, uh, Christians cannot really build new churches, even though they are multiplying, while mosques are uh, coming up like mushrooms, you know. It's, I'm not against uh, building mosques, but I'm saying there, is, there are no equal rights because okay. of a legacy of Islam. We have to move on. We only have a few minutes left here on the show. I want to pose one of my last questions to Rahman. Um, if Islam conquers um, and rules the world, Rahman, Tell me, or can you just give me one example? We only have a couple minutes left on the show. One example how all of mankind would be treated fairly under Islamic law. Rahman, are you still with us? Hello? Yes, did you hear the question? We only have a, a couple minutes left on the show. I wanted to, you to give me one example, if Islam were to rule the world today, give us one example of how mankind would be treated fairly um, under an Islamic empire. Are you speaking to the caller? Uh, no, I'm speaking to our guest, Rahman. If he's not there, I will pose the question to uh, Anjum. 
go ahead, Anjum. You you can go ahead and take that question for us, and then I will um we'll, we'll end the show. You know, um, when you talk about fairness, fairness is only according to the Sharia. You know, uh, you got to have a look at the definition of these terms. For us, oppression is anything against the command of God, and justice is whatever God legislates. So, uh, fairness and justice is not according to what you think or I think or what we feel. Otherwise, every single person is going to have their own dimension and their own criteria to what is fair and what is just. So we look to the Qur'an. The Qur'an says that fairness within society is uh, for the Muslims, obviously, you know, to have their own law uh, that they have to abide by. And as Brother Mizan rahman quite rightly said, there are certain laws where they differ with the uh, non-Muslims, and there are certain laws which are applicable to both. So, for example, you know, both of them will be punished for adultery, for fornication, for rape, for stealing, etc. Whereas a non-Muslim is not obliged to pray, and he will not be forced to become Muslim. But the Muslim, on the other hand, he will be punished if he does not pray, and so on. So, a fairness and justice according to the divine law of God, not according to our own whims and desires. And therefore, you know, what I would say as well is that, you know, you know, there are many people who want to make, for example, equality between uh, the two genders. Islam does not have a gender war. We believe in complete distinction of responsibility and duty for both the male and the female. But that does not mean that in the eyes of God, they are not equal. Everyone is equal in the eyes of God. And we all have an opportunity to worship him in this life. So, you know, I would urge all Muslims and non-Muslims once again, and your Christian listeners and you, of course, as well, Sama, to think about Islam as an alternative. I know there's a few, you know, little digs here and there, you know, against Muslims on your program. And similarly, you know, we also respond. But I think, I think at the end of the day, all of us should supplicate to God uh, to guide us to the truth. And if we are already upon the truth, then to confirm us in it. And if not, to guide us to the truth in order to worship him in this life and to achieve benefit and salvation in this life and in the hereafter, which is, I think, what we all want. We all want benefit and goodness in this life and to be saved on the day of judgment. I believe that is Islam. And I believe that that is something which should be good for you. But, you know, I'm happy to debate and discuss. And I, I, always, I always appreciate the fact that you invite me onto your program and give me an opportunity uh, to speak and to, you know, clarify, I think, many of the misconceptions that people have nowadays about Islam and the Muslims. And we're all, always open to uh, open the flows of debate here. Uh, Kamal, I want to give you the last word, and then we have to end the show. Two minutes. Oh, well, uh, you know, again, Islam is not religion of peace. And... Uh, and uh, we have to be aware of uh, confusion, you know, Islam, uh, you know, with our world uh, standard today and worldview. And Islam does not have even its own religion equality between women and men and between, you know, uh, non-Muslim and Muslim. And with this, uh, it's itself uh, hypocrisy. Okay. Thank you, Kamal. Thank you, Anjum. Thank you, Rahman. And thank you, Pastor Hisham, all for joining us this evening. We will be back in two weeks uh, from tonight, so stay tuned for that. Also, stay tuned tomorrow night, Pastor Joseph on News and Views at 10.30 p.m. Eastern. And again, a final note for this Friday's debate um, at 8 p.m. Eastern between Robert Spencer and Imam Mustafa Zayed. That, uh, that's 8 p.m. this Friday night. We sure appreciate you joining us here on Jihad Exposed. We, we hope you have a great night, and we'll see you next time. Jihad has come to America. Devastating a series of terrorist attacks in history. The only deen Allah accept is Al Islam. And whoever seek any other deen apart from Islam will never be accepted. We stand together to win the war against terrorism.